welcome to the Knock Talk. I'm your host, Wayne Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA. Another episode of Number Toby Singers, Let's Get Biblical Q&A. Coming to you from the Holy Land, Rabbi Tovia, the man, singer. <laughs> Good to see you guys. How are you doing? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, How are you, sir? Oh, much better. Thank you. Very Thank good. you very much. Very, 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 very well. Awesome. 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 So, uh, yeah. <laughs> any uh, anything interesting happened this week for you besides uh, besides our last walk across the street, of course? <laughs> the air thing got in my what the interesting thing you want to know the interesting thing that happened this week i'll tell you what's interesting okay i went to film a hanukkah message outside in front of the oldest protestant church in jerusalem in the old city of Yerushalayim. Wow. Wait, wait. I, I'm outside on the on the street, like outside the okay. church. And this church is a, is not just noted for being the oldest Protestant church in the old city. Um, it is noted because it was created in the mid 19th century, quite literally in 1849, for the purpose of converting the Jews in Jerusalem to Christianity. It was funded by a very well-heeled organization, uh, the London Society for Propagating the Gospel to the Jews. Literally, the purpose of this church was to convert the pop Jewish population, which at that time was massive, uh, to Christianity, to this, to get them all baptized. Hmm, wow, that's right. So, I mean, where could a Hanukkah message be more more special, more right, unique? Right. Now, I'm doing this on Friday, and Shabbos starts very early here in Yerushalayim. Uh, Shabbos starts like a few minutes before three o'clock in the afternoon. And as soon as I start, so I'm not on the church property and I wouldn't go on a church property uh, for any reason. So I'm outside of it, but apparently they c c could see me through their closed circuit TVs that I'm on the street. Look, I don't know what went on in there. All I know is everyone came out, Anglican priests came out, Missionaries came out, and they were threatening to call the police if oh I didn't gosh. leave the area because I wow. was not allowed. They didn't want me filming with the church, which is in a the most public area possible. It's where nearly five million tourists every year pass through. It's right inside of Jaffa Gate. Just go to the right, and there it is. So that whole place is there for the purpose of converting Jews to Christianity. And they did not want me to film there. <laughs> and, and it's a public area and it's a tourist area. And the, the rector himself came running out. Don't ask, it was the public. And I said, call the police. This is, I'm not kidding, I'm making this up. And so I just wanted to, Give a Hanukkah message. That's insane. And it would match that church perfectly. And and they and it was a whole scene. And the clock was ticking for me because I thought I had plenty of time Friday, but it was just I was surrounded by mission was very, very hostile. You know, it was very interesting. So one missionary out there, someone who works for the church, became very, very hostile. And and just um, the, almost everyone was acting in a way that was um, sophomoric. But this fellow was like going, um, what, the, he demanded that I get permission from the director of the church to film outside in the public area. Like they get permission from rabbis right. to film outside of a synagogue. And he says, what is it about that that you don't understand? So I said, I, something I don't understand what you're saying. I just don't agree that 
I need permission in a public area to film if the church is there. And and then he said, he was like really obnoxious. And then so some of them ran off. I, I don't they ran off to call the police. In the meantime, he just turns to me and goes, Christ is Lord. <laughs> he said to me, Christ is Lord. And I'm thinking to myself, you have to be tone deaf. I mean, this would not be a very I mean, he, he couldn't possibly have picked a worse time to say to me, Christ is Lord, as he just threatened to call the police for me doing nothing. Right, right. I mean, Christians are filming all over Jewish areas. There are synagogues everywhere, and Christians have no problem doing that. They don't go to every day, oh, there's a synagogue in the background. Let me ask the rabbi. I mean, and but it, it's there's really a a disconnect there's like some disconnect between these people and reality because like if for whatever reason <laughs> i was I didn't want christians to film the outs out outside of a synagogue in public the, and let's say i wasn't happy let's say i could see that i i just don't want a christian to film that means they don't believe in the Jewish. I don't want them to film outside of a synagogue without getting my permission or the rabbi's permission. If let's say I didn't want that, I couldn't imagine what circumstances that would be. But I would not be turning to the person who I just said I'm going to call the police to and say, "Would you consider uh, you should convert to Christianity?" I, excuse me, you should convert to Judaism, like. That's, right now, yeah, this is not the moment. Right. Like it's just, it, it just shows. At least me, unless I'm, I live in an alternative universe, which I might. <laughs> um, that is that. There's just some disconnect there. Like really, that's the time where I'm going. You know, I never thought about accepting Christ before, but now that you're calling the cops, I, no. I probably <laughs> should consider that. It's a great sales pitch. For sure. It's unbelievable. So I was really going, you know what? There's something going on here. That means we we live in an alternative universe. Mm -hmm. uh, because like I, I would like that that's like that's a little that's would be the last time in the there's no possible time that I can imagine where someone would find Christianity less attractive than when the Christian leaders are while he's calling the cops on me. He says, Christ is Lord. It's, it's like, insane. have you no self-control? I mean, have you no... And, and, and then I thought to myself, you know, the, like my great-great-grandparents like lived in Christian in countries where these guys had the key to power and authority. Like there was a time when these people really had real power. They don't now. Not in your Eretz Yisrael. That means these guys I mean, that means Jews lived in this spiritual North Korea. And and what that guy said now is just rhetorical. He had no power. I, I wasn't doing anything illegal. I had nothing to be concerned about. Right. But imagine living in a world where someone like that had real power. Wow. And my great-great-grandparents did. And it's just going, wow, I had to live under this the shleet of the sovereignty of this, and it's just unimaginable. But it's, it also shows a, you know, it, it, people say to me, Tovia, I really admire you because I think you have a good grasp on Christian theology. Christians, former Christians say that, that you really get it. And I have to concede I don't get all of it because I don't get that. Like I would, if, if I wanted a non-Jew to convert to Judaism for whatever reason, the last thing I'd be doing is be calling the cops. And while I'm doing <laughs> that, having mm -hmm. that done, I said, you should consider uh, becoming a member of our synagogue. That's insane. It just, mm -hmm. so that's, that's the craziest thing that happened. Right. Wow. That's insane. <laughs> you can't be, wow is right. I, I can't even wow wrap my head around that. Yeah, great. that's insane. I, what can I say? <sighs> Not much after that. Right, that's so for sure. Okay. Does that, can I ask you a question? Because yeah. you come from her. Does yes. that story make sense to you? You're going, you know what? I've been there and. I've seen it. 
I've seen it before. I've, I've actually experienced it before. I've never been that way towards anybody. Um, no, but do you like get it? Like get that world thing where someone could be so completely out of touch, so disconnected. I do from because I think what happens with, with with the encounters that I've had is that people once once they on the initial on the initial connect on the initial contact between the two, um, they're very confident and they're very bold and they're they they're they got it locked in. They know exactly what to say, but the moment that you throw anything to derail them, they go into panic mode. And when they go into panic mode, they just start reaching for anything that comes to their head. You know, before you know it, it's, it's, it's completely. Yeah. Derailed. But why, like why that would like, why if you call the police on a woman, that would be not a good time to ask her for a date. It just, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't right, know. Exactly. You know what I'm yeah. Saying? Yeah. Like, agreed. Yeah, it just, that's that panic. It, and then I said, to him, there's such a disconnect there. It, it's right. so, like, he would just turn to me like Christ is Lord. And, and I mean, is it conceivable that I would turn to him and so, you know, I, you know, now that you bring that up, I, I just, it <laughs> never occurred to me, you that's know, right. and, and maybe I should think about getting baptized. Uh, maybe we'll do that after the cops show up and, Maybe that would be a good idea. Where where do I sign up? Because I I'd never realized that that was an option. And you know what? I'm feeling kind of Christy right now. So it's it's like, and then that's I'm like, nice. so there's just something that's just so completely yep. disconnected from reality. I mean, just normal. If you're, but what should I say? Right. You know, that was that was an interesting thing. And I was I was just shocked. Shock. That's hilarious. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and move on and take this call. Caller. Let's do this. Uh, welcome. Right, What's the question for Emily? Hi. This is a question for Tovia. I'm wondering if when the Messiah shows up, how do we know that he would not be crucified to a cross, much like Jesus would, if he were to come saying that he is the Son of God or a messenger of God? How do we know any prophets or any messengers of God would not be crucified if he were to show? That's a good question. All right, Robert, you got this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, all right. So we 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 always ask the question. Well, why don't we figure find out from God? I mean, why don't we go to the Jewish scriptures, to the prophets of Israel, and hear something about the the mandate that is given to the Mashiach? Because that's not the kind of thing that the prophets would just forget to mention. Well, as it turns out, it, it's found nowhere in the Jewish scriptures. Rather, we are told that the Mashiach is going to give that he will rebuke, he will teach many nations and the nations will immediately grasp what they had done wrong. And they're going to beat their swords into plowshares, their their spears into pruning hooks. So the implements of execution, a spear, a, a nail, all these things that were formally used to bring about to bring violence and death will be transformed into implements of bringing us food and things to eat. I mean, I mean, it's literally a play on words uh, of of lechem. There won't be lechem because it, it, it there won't be milchama. You see, in Hebrew, the the root just plays itself. Isaiah is just exquisite in, in doing this, and that is instead of milchama, you can hear that there will be lechem, which means. Everything prior to the Mashiach comes that had been used in any way to bring about violence is going to be transformed into an instrument that brings not milchama, but lechem instead. It's, Isaiah is so delicious. And you, you, my dear friends, with all the love in the world, if you're not reading the Hebrew scriptures in Hebrew, it means you've never experienced love in your life. You never gave Hashem a kiss. You certainly can get some 
some sense of what's going on. I'm not saying that, but you, you're, it's really kissing God through a towel. You're just missing out on the whole thing. And more often than not, it's not just you're not getting color, you're only getting black and white on an old zenith. It's, but here it's totally stripped. So we find this theme throughout Tanakh. Isaiah 11 is going to repeat the theme again, where the Mashiach is going to, the word Mashiach is not used there. It's, it's, that word appears in Tanakh less than 40 times. It's never in Tanakh ref, referring to the Messiah. That's the way we talk today, and that's fine. Um, but whenever we have texts that everyone agrees is referring to the Mashiach and the Messianic age. There's no one would disagree about Isaiah chapter 2. We're told it'll be at the end of days, the Achras Ayamim. Isaiah 11 is the same. This person who is a descendant, who's a branch from the root of Jesse, he, he's not going to judge people after the sight of his eyes. He, he's not going to judge people if they're, if they're wealthy, if they're attractive. He's he is going to, you know, judge them well, and people who are not will be condemned. No, no, no. The spirit of Hashem is going to rest upon him. There are other people like this in history, uh, going back to Bezalel and others who, they were able to use a wisdom like King Solomon that Hashem uh, placed upon them, King David and so on. So the reason that the Messiah is not going to be crucified is because we have an unambiguous prophecy that is found everywhere in the prophetic part of the Jewish scriptures, everywhere. The oracular prophets are clear about this, of what he's supposed to do, and that is to transform the world by producing a message that's absolutely irresistible, and the result of it is that violence will come to an end. In Isaiah 9, we are told that little children will not have to worry about being near a place that would have been dangerous, um, animals that were former enemies, prey and, uh, and predators will lie together because it's a time that will be complete peace. It, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that predator animals today literally will become herbivorous. I don't believe that's what's being conveyed, but rather that's a, a metaphor. You could believe that, that would be fine. Uh, but it's very clear that this is not a, Isaiah 11 is not a class in zoology or what we can expect, what would change in the natural order of the world. What's being conveyed is that former enemies will be together. So the last thing in the world that would unfold in the messianic age is that the Messiah himself will, would be the victim of violence, of a spear, of a of a nail, of a crucifixion. It's just the opposite. All that will come to an end. And instruments of violence will be transformed and they'll be used only to provide bread. The whole world will speak in a pure language, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea, Isaiah 11, verse 9. And Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, tells us that all the world will accept the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and therefore God will be king of the whole world, meaning the whole world will accept him as king. And that's how we know. How do we know? Because my Bible says so. And I trust the word of Hashem. Thank you for your question. Very, very good. Very good. Thank you, Robert, for that. Okay, we're going to take this text. Caller, caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name, where you're calling from. Hmm. Hello? Yes, you're live on the air. Good morning, um, William and Rabbi. How are you? Doing great. Who are we speaking with? Doing well. My question is, um, can you point me to some verses from Tanakh that unambiguously say that the Messiah was only supposed to come once. But I know that, Rabbi, on, on your show, on many times you've said that redemption oftentimes comes in stages, and you cited uh, the plagues of Israel and, uh, and whatnot. Um, so is there a possibility that Mashiach could come twice? And if not, what verses from Tanakh tell us that that, that cannot happen? Mm. 
Excellent. Excellent question. Okay. Thank you thank for your call. Just go ahead and hang up now and tune in for your answer. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. So there's a distinction here uh, to be marked off. Uh, Tanakh tells us, now these are not the words that are used, but we, we need to use conventional language, especially uh, to represent the messages found in books like Isaiah, which are which is a book that is 90% of it is poetry. 90% of it is, um, is this very dense language. And Isaiah does not use conventional language to convey his eternal messages. That does not in, by any stretch of the imagination mean that we don't know what Isaiah is saying. On the contrary, it's easier to understand Isaiah than it is to understand the prophetic message of Samuel, because Samuel is loaded with um, using a language that's standard prose, very little, very little poetry. We have a storyline, but sometimes you you could not be clear. What am I supposed to walk away from? This? What message should I carry away from the story? Conversely, Isaiah is just hitting you with prophecy constantly. He's the the classical of uh, the, the classic oracular prophet. So what we would look for is a sign in Isaiah of what is supposed to happen. If the Messiah could come two, three, four times, it raises a so number one, of course, it's not in there, and that would be very important. But it raises a problem, a massive problem, because if the if it is nowhere said in Tanakh that the Messiah could come twice, so then it be, then anyone could be the Messiah, and then it would be impossible to identify who the Messiah is. It become everything becomes unfalsifiable, and that's very dangerous. So Tanakh wants to make it very clear that you're going to know. And the problem is, this is the kind of thing where you have to sort of just think this through. Well, how do you know the Messiah isn't going to come three times? So the moment you say that he's going to come and fulfill none of the prophecies that are clearly expressed in the Jewish scriptures, that are transformative, not just subjectively, but to the world. For instance, the worldwide knowledge of God, the building of a temple that would stand forever in Jerusalem, the universal knowledge of God, Isaiah 11, 9, Zechariah 14, 9. It's everything. That's the, the building of the temple. Those are the last passages of Ezekiel 37, the last three verses, verse uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26, 27, 28, the whole end of Ezekiel, the ingathering of the exiles, ingathering of the exiles, Isaiah 43, verse 6, as an example, the resurrection of the dead, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. Elijah the prophet will come and usher in that final redemption. That's the very last few passages conveyed in the delicious Sefer, Sefer Malachi, the last book of the prophetic works that we have. Uh, a worldwide peace on earth. I mean, these are th- these are things that when they occur, the whole world will know, and that's what's conveyed in, in messages. It's it's these passages, these epic passages, are pregnant with the message that when Mashiach comes, the whole world will know, and ten Gentiles will cr- come will t- grab the hem of a Jew and say. Take us with you, because now we know that God is with you. Zechariah eight twenty three. There means there will be no religious dissension in the world. The entire world will embrace the Jewish faith. That means there won't be all this these many different religions in the world. Everyone will come to know about the one true God. Now, if a person can be the Messiah and do none of those things, accomplish zero, 
and then die like everyone dies, meaning everyone dies either. It's called natural causes. Really, people always die of something, really. But we're just going to use conventional language, okay? So you know, people actually always die of something. Um, but let's just not say that. Let's just say natural causes so we can have a, 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 a normal conversation. So five people either die of natural causes or nishtagadach, sometimes somebody is killed and could have lived longer if some catastrophic event hadn't occurred. Regardless, then anybody could be the Messiah and it becomes unfalsifiable. And what is conveyed exquisitely in Tanakh, it's unambiguous is that everyone gets it immediately, everyone recognizes it immediately. By having a second coming, it sounds like a good thing, but by having a second coming, what, what that conveys is that the first coming, the, the first arrival, it didn't happen, so there's no way to identify it. Uh, let me share something with you a little bit, a little exquisite. So there are passages in in Daniel 10 and 11, Daniel 8, I could go on and on. And as I do, like my mouth is getting watery. Zechariah 8, Zechariah 9 and 11. It's so delicious that I, it's like before you, I'm about to eat a delicious meal, like the, the words are just flowing through my mouth and my mind, just very, really quite elegant. Now, some of those, passages, we would, when they were first um, preached, Zechariah lived roughly 2,500 years ago. He lived at the be very beginning of the first temple period. People certainly knew what he was talking about, but there were some things they couldn't be sure of how they would happen. And there are prophecies in at the end of Daniel, which at the time they were expressed, they couldn't, they didn't even know what the Greek Empire was during the Babylonian Empire. And when Isaiah preached, who, what would they have made of Isaiah 45? Who was Cyrus? Uh, so the key is that the reason why there are Messianic prophecies that are difficult to unpack, like we get what's going on, but there are details there, which we have to say, you know what, when it happens, well, then no, it is because when it happens, we'll be able to identify it immediately. I mean, we'll be able to go with precision. Ah, that's what Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14 or verse 11 means. Ah, that's the 2300 days. So that's very important so that when something happens that's just weird, but has nothing to do with the Bible or just a earthquake or a volcanic eruption that just occurred in New Zealand where a number of people lost their lives. Well, that's been happening for thousands of years. There'll be no way to identify that. So what happens is it all becomes unfalsifiable and then you can wind up in a, in a horrible religion because the message would be conveyed without it coming from the Messiah. So therefore, the key uh, element of the messianic age is that the whole world will know. God will be king of the whole universe. Now, you have to understand what that means. What does Zechariah 14 mean? In that day, God will be king of the whole world. Is not God the king of the whole world today? Think about that for a moment. Is was is God not was God not the king of the whole world 2,500 years ago when Zechariah first preached that message? So uh, the knee jerk reaction might be, well, of course he was king. He was God was always God, but a king who is not recognized by his subjects is not their king. If if subjects say, I don't accept this man as king, then he's not their king. He might be in control of them, as God is certainly, but he's, the, they, this is very deep, they have not accepted God as their king, and therefore God is not king over them because his subjects do not recognize him as king. Got it? So God was always king of the world, but God 
today is not king over the whole world in that much of the world does not recognize the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as king. So what Zechariah Hanovi, HaKodesh Va'ator is declaring, this is so, mm, so good, is that when Mashiach comes, the whole world will say, I am your subject, you are my king. You understand what's going on? So therefore, um, th that has to be the core part of it. If that doesn't happen, then it's not the Mashiach, and then anybody could be the Messiah. It becomes unfalsifiable. Now, let's go to the other, to the other um, side of that question. That is, we know that in every redemptive process, it, it that event occurs over time. Uh, why did God need to bring 11, 10 plague, plagues over Egypt, which took place over the course of some 11 months? Why not one plague would have been enough? Moreover, why did God need Pharaoh's permission? Why didn't God could have just killed everybody, all the Egyptians out, and he could have arranged that. I mean, that would have been a, a no-brainer. Why a why a redent why did the Jews have to walk around Jericho so many times with noises and sound? Why a whole process? And why give all these warnings to those nations who are in the land to reconsider Deuteronomy chapter twenty? And why does the events that are happening now how happening over a course of time? It's because Hashem is the merciful one and he wants people to do true. He wants people to repent. So you have a series of events, take the Exodus, for example, you have a series of events that are unfolding in the Exodus. Moses is called, stands before Pharaoh, and then people can go, oh, look at that. Ah, oh, maybe I should repent. You know, how many people are watching this show right now who are, who are considering the holy words of our prophets and are going, maybe it's time for me to reconsider my spiritual decision in my life, why? Because Hashem is so merciful. Maybe to me, I would wish that it should all happen in one moment. Because I was fortunate to be raised in a religious home. But as it turns out, Hashem is the the real Rachman. He's the one who's truly merciful. So he just wants the world to do tshuva. But it's a singular redemptive process that I believe, I'm not sure, I'm not hearing voices, I don't see visions, none of that. It just would seem to me that what is happening today and what is, has been unfolding in, even before my generation, but this whole epic is part of a prophetic process that is, in my mind, can only mean that we are already in a series of events that are unfolding, and it's just so that people would do tshuva, that people would repent. But it's not broken up. It can't be separate where everything that's happened from the year 1900 to now would be undone, and the Jews would be in, go to Russia and live in Europe and go back to all these places, and and then nothing would happen for 150. I mean, that's unimaginable. There's really many, many reasons for that, uh, but I'm not going to go into it. It's a, it's a pre but incidentally and conversely, there's a reciprocal, and that is whenever Hashem is bringing about judgments, where bad things, like terrible things are going to happen. I mean, everything is good, really, but in our view, Hashem doesn't just bring about the destruction of a temple immediately. The first temple was destroyed, and there were three exiles, three waves of exiles before the before the first temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. It wouldn't just happen in one shot. Why? Because people should do tshuva, should repent. As it turned out, they didn't, but they could have. And that was a that was an that was an unfortunate failure. So in every time, every time with this uh, Peronius, when there is punishment or judgment, it happens over the course of time, not in an instant, because people should go, oh, let's do tshuva. This is in the hands of Hashem, and we have to look at Tanakh and say, ah, oh, look how this matches perfectly, and it does. This is a very good question. I'm I'm very I'm delighted that you asked it because so many people have asked it 
over the years, but just not on the year. Thank you for joining us. Okay, Eric, very good. All right, we'll move on to the next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Yes, uh, I'm Doug Grant from Federal Way. Hello, Doug, I welcome. I just have a question. Uh, thanks a lot, Bill. I, I could call the program, and I really appreciate it. I learned a lot from the rabbi. Rebbe, I just want to ask a question. Um, how come the, the Jewish nation haven't had a prophet for the last 2,500 years? Hmm. Okay. That's a good question. Okay. Thank you for your call, and go ahead and hang up now. You can tune in, okay? Thank you. You bet. Thanks, bye. Right. So the reason why, the real simple reason why the prophets didn't have a prophet, and when we use the word prophet, it does not mean that there were not people who had Ruach HaKodesh, who in some way were able to glean a message from Hashem. But why did the formal series of prophets of Israel come to a conclusion with um, with Chagai, um, Zechariah, and Malachi. Why? And the answer is, is that they needed prophets to build the base having dush. That's why it was necessary. And without prophets, the Jewish people could not go ahead with building a base having dush. I am I'm, I'm sitting here, and my frontal lobe is dancing a little bit. And my cerebellum is wondering how deep I should go. I'll go a little deeper with you. I'll just go a little, sweep a little more. So as it turns out, it, the Jewish people 2,500 years ago, when Cyrus gave the command to return to Yerushalayim and to rebuild the base of Migdosh, roughly 50 years after the destruction of the first temple, if Klal Yisrael, if the Bnei Yisrael would have returned in very large numbers, that it could have been that Mashiach could have come then. And tragically, only 42,360 Jews left Babylon, and we don't know the numbers, but it, certainly a million or millions of Jews stayed behind in Borough Park, Brooklyn. But because the Jews had an opportunity to trigger it at the time, there had to be prophets in place for such a thing to occur. If they were going to build a base Hamigdash, and for that to occur, you had to have Chagai Zechariah Malachi standing by. As it turned out, the second temple was built, but it was it was in troubled times. This is a prophecy given to us by the by the angel Gabriel in Daniel chapter nine. And that temple would only last for 420 years. And it, although we, we would have uh, people who would be pretenders to be king, such as the Maccabees, and it was a, a, a family that started out very well but failed because they misappropriated the kingship, th there was no longer a need for prophets. So one of the things should be said, a prophet cannot add a mitzvah to the Torah. The prophets of, cannot introduce a new mitzvah. If they do, they're a false prophet. They can't take away from a, a mitzvah. That's, that's why Deuteronomy 13 verse 1, which is the chapter devoted to false prophets, begins with the prohibition of adding or taking away from the Torah. And the Christians Bibles, the people who arranged Christian Bibles were not idiots. They were very wise to hide Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 and bury it at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 12. Why did they cut it that way? Because they didn't want it connected to the false prophet. But, so if you open up a Hebrew Jewish Bible, Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 tells us about the prohibition of adding or taking away from the Torah, and then talks about in that context the false prophet. Because <laughs> that's one of the things where you could, no matter what he does, pick a card and it doesn't make a difference. If he's adding or taking away from the Torah, get rid of him. And there are other things if he tells you to follow God, your fathers didn't know. Uh, the, uh, the guys who divided up the chapters in the Christian Bibles were would have 
done very well in the Rorschach test. And they took that passage in the beginning of chapter 13, verse 1, and schmuchled it. That's a high English word. That means they shoved it at the end of verse 12. So it's sort of severed from it, it's disconnected from it. And that was, um, so that's why we don't, so Tanakh today contains in it the message a complete message that we can continue with. But it is not that we don't, we did not have great people who had Ruach HaKodesh, who God in some way conveyed to them a message that was a divine message, but they were not from the series of Nevi'im and their message wasn't necessarily those were committed to all generations. So that was a really long answer to a simple question. Chag HaZachari and Malachi were there for the second, building a second temple. In that time, Mashiach could have come. It unfortunately did not happen at that time. And when they died, then prophecy, when I mean prophecy, I mean in the very formal sense, came to an end. That's the reason why. Thank you so much for your question. Okay, good answers. Okay, we'll move on to the next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Caller, you're live. you're live on the air. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I'm Robert Jones from California. Robert, welcome. And my question is, if prophets can't change the Torah, how exactly did Elijah offer a sacrifice outside of the temple in Jerusalem if... Uh, at that time, they couldn't offer sacrifices outside of the temples in Jerusalem. Like, it's, uh, you know, Refer against the prophets of Baal. Right, and... right. Okay. That makes sense. Robert, you got it? Okay, that's my question. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's like, you know, um, so, like, I like Davin. Not every day, but at least once a week during my prayers to God. I ask Hashem that he would see it fit that I would have a caller like that who would ask such an exquisite question. <laughs> that's awesome. Really. Okay. That, that's, like, that's like the question like one in once a year I'll get a question that's so brilliant, that's so insightful. Awesome. So, and so as it turns out, this question is brilliant. We, we are told for famously in First Kings um, 18, that Elijah did something where he built an altar on Mount Carmel. And let me assure you, I've been there many times. It is not in Jerusalem. And he challenged the priests of Baal, and hundreds of them took up the challenge. Ahav, the king of, the, of Israel, meaning the northern kingdom, arranged the whole deal because there was a catastrophe in the Klal Yisrael, and the catastrophe was that Achav and his wife, who was very evil, Achav, we are told in Tanakh, was a horrible person. He was the king of the northern kingdom. He was one of 19 kings of the northern kingdom, and all of them were bad. He was the worst of the worst, and his wife was a thousand times worse than him. This was a, a nightmare couple that was mamish destroying Kal Yisrael. And it was, it was something absolutely horrible. And it was in the north. It wasn't in the southern part of Eretz Yisrael, which is Machos Yehudu. Not that everything was perfect in Hunky Dory, but the 19 kings of the northern kingdom were just a disaster one after the other. We're told the Novi that Achav was the worst of all. And Achav, Achav arranges this event. This was a nightmare that was happening. It was something that could have destroyed Klai Yisrael. In fact, we see the next chapter, of chapter 19, that Elijah thought it, the Jews were destro utterly destroyed. So, uh, so the question is, how was Elijah able to do something that would, in, under ordinary circumstances, be forbidden? And that is to bring carbonus, to bring an offering outside of Jerusalem, because the Torah tells us that you should only bring the offering only in the place that I will designate, and you should lie as it. And in fact, this was an issue that had confronted many kings, and that is that Jews were building altars in their own properties, not in Jerusalem, called Bamos, 
they were not idolatrous in any way. It was just you you had this Yushalayim had to be the place where altars were. So the question is, how was Eliyad Novi able to do such a thing? And the answer was that it was called the Hayrasha, which means just like, for example, a person is not allowed to drive on Shabbos. Huh? But a woman is is about to give birth and <laughs> And the water breaks. It happened to me. I didn't. No one taught me about water breaking. I didn't know what it was, but water broke. And when water broke, you don't ask questions. And if it's Shabbos, you'll say, "Well, it's still the Sabbath. I can't get into the car." And uh, and you know, because my my daughter is going to be born, we'll we'll have to wait this out another sixteen hours. So as it turns out, that when there's an emergency of epic proportions that you can then violate the Torah, because the Torah says in Deuteronomy 30 that v'chai bohem, you should live by them. And sometimes there is an exception where life is in danger, where people, where something has to be done at that moment in order to fend off death, to fend off an immediate catastrophe. So in in an exceptional situation, exceptional measures are done. Elio Hanavi was able to not to say, I am changing. One can never say we're changing the rules forever. But one could say that at this moment, in a time of tremendous danger, where Klausel could have been destroyed, and Elio Hanavi had to confront Jews, and this was a great danger, because Jews who were worshipping Baal, they really were <clears throat> uh, Jews for Baal. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They were worshipping Baal, but they still retained their Jewish identity. They didn't go, we're not Jewish anymore. They said, we worship Baal, and we worship the God of Israel. We have both. We have a, a bianity. How do you know what I'm saying is true? And I'm not trying to be cute. Because it says so. And Elijah was very angry at them. And he says to them in verse 21 of 1 Kings 18, how long will you halt between these two opinions? Just choose one or the other. Choose God, choose Baal. Choose one or the other. You can't be both. You can't be doing Christmas in Hanukkah, in a, in a Hanukkah bush. And you can't do that. So you can imagine the, so it's such an urgent situation. Jews were in a, in a death camp and they had to eat treif or die. So the, at those extreme situations, Jews did practically, the only thing a Jew would not allow to be do is he wouldn't be allowed to worship idols or things of that nature. Uh, there are certain sins that under no circumstances could be violated. There are three such cardinal sins. Um, someone says, if you don't murder that person, I'll kill you. So you have to allow yourself to die. But barring that, barring those three cardinal sins, there could be something called a hirasha. That means there's just an urgent mo moment. So normally a person does it this way, but when there's an emergency, we, we do allow for a temporary moment, uh, not even allow for it. A person can say, oh yes, my two-year-old has is running a 104 degree temperature, huh? But it's Shabbos, and I want to be a very religious person. I'm going to wait till Shabbos is over before I go to the hospital. Because after all, you get into a car, you start a car, it's a, you trigger a, a combustion engine. The terrorist says you can't kindle a fire on the Shabbos day. You can't do that. You can't say I'm going to be more religious and not do such a thing. So therefore, there is a hirasha, there is a moment with this such urgency that the normal rules that govern us are suspended, but not that the rule doesn't exist. Just, the situation is such of such urgency that, that a prophet could say, for this moment, there's an emergency, the building's on fire, you have to get out and get out, no matter how you have to get out. If the house has is on fire and you don't have a ladder to put it out, you don't have to at that moment worry about going to your friend's house and just grabbing his ladder without permission to put out the fire to rescue someone. Ah, I'm stealing his ladder. But it's a hirah show, it was an emergency. And that's why Eliyahu uh, did what he did and God condoned it. And it was a marvelous day. And you can see what he was up against because Achav, this very wicked king, was, un, was 
very impressed with this demonstration of the power of Hashem. Izevel, that great luminary he was married to, she said, bide your time, you'll see what will happen. That was Hayrasha, and that's a brilliant question. Thank you, I, that I thank Hashem that I was Zecha to respond to such a question on there. Okay, very good. We're going to go ahead and catch this next caller then. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Uh, my name is Dennis. I'm from Minnesota. Welcome, Dennis. Welcome to the show. Thank you much. My question is, well, I, I guess I should say a little bit more. When I was in Bible college, that's when I learned that uh, uh, Christianity was a lie. Judaism was the truth. Torah was the truth. Um, and actually, I want to thank... Uh, uh, Rabbi Sanger, because uh, his books were very, very helpful, um, leading me out of uh, uh, idolatry. Mm. The pain that I have now is so many friends, my family, and I even have one daughter who is still deeply in Christianity. And I question, why did Hashem allow Christianity to, uh, I don't want to say flourish, but why did he there's this confusion because there's so many people that want to follow Hashem, want to follow the one true God, but yet they're confused and they're stuck. And uh, it, it, to me, for me, it's just heartbreaking. Why did Hashem allow Christianity to even exist? So let me so stay on the phone. Thank you for calling. And let, I, I want to, I really am very grateful to you and thank you for your time. I want to ask you a question. Please do. Let's play the game, what if? Let's, in fact, let's take your question, let's run with it, okay? So let's ask the question of what if the world had no other religions that were persuasive, that were attractive, and the only religion that people felt was satisfying emotionally was Judaism. So we could see that that might be a really good thing, right? But could could that could that actually be a problem in some way? Do you hear the could question? Could it be a problem? What's that? Could it be a problem? You broke up, so I didn't quite hear everything. I apologize. Sure, I'm going to repeat. Let me repeat that. I really want you to because I want I want to ask the question, what if? That means let's do that. Let's ask that question. Uh, so what if, in fact, you had your druthers? It happened that way. What happened? That in fact, only Judaism was attractive and no, all the other religions were, tr had, were not attractive, had nothing to offer people that made them feel better. If Judaism was the only religion that gave people a sense of spirituality and, and Christianity and no other religion had that ability, could you sense what problem that might ignite? Yes. Okay, what might that problem be? Then people won't be allowed to choose Right. Uh, the that one means that, you, that means it would be like someone holding a gun to, to your wife's head and, and tell her, unless you tell this man I love you, I'll kill you. So she turns to you and says to you, I love you. So the meaning, the, the meaningfulness of that statement has been, has been vanquished. Essentially, by allowing other religions to be satisfying spiritually, to make people feel good, to connect them to God, means that people have free will and could choose. And therefore, when you said to God that I reject Christianity utterly, it really was meaningful because you could have found another outlet for feeling spiritual, but you were loyal to Hashem so it would be like a man and a woman on a deserted island and spend their whole lives there. Only one man, one woman. So would Hashem reward them for not committing adultery? 
No. Why? Because there's no free will. There was no other human being to for, with which to do this. Hashem put made sure that on this world, there's always free will. And either you can move toward him or away from him. But now in a world where Christianity and Hinduism, all these other religions exist, when a person says to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I love you, I, I serve you and no one else, it's really a meaningful statement that virtue would become impossible if there was no other attractive religion in the world. That's it. That's a great answer. Can I ask one more question? Certainly. Sure. What about my daughter that I led into idolatry and now I'm tormented as she's seemingly stuck there? How old is she? 26. Yeah. So you, know, you say she's stuck there, but I, I would suggest that there was a time in your yeah. life when someone would said would have said about you, God, he's so stuck in Christianity, nothing would get him out. It means that instead of viewing your life as frozen in time, it really was transitional. So just have the patience with your daughter that Hashem had with you. He waited a lifetime for you to worship him alone and to praise him alone and to bend your knee to him alone. And right now your daughter is, now I, I know nothing about her life and where it is and right now we're on air, so we're just dealing in simple principles. But Hashem is going to open doors for her in her life and then with Hashem's help, she will have free will. And then she's gonna to need to walk through that it's important for you to maintain a good relationship with her despite the this uncomfortable situation. Stop beating yourself up for this because you, at the time you were just doing whatever you thought was right and you were robbed of information because the church made sure to give you translations that were utterly corrupt. Hashem doesn't judge you the way he would have judged me if I would have become a Christian. So. Know that Hashem is very, very patient. Make sure your relationship with your daughter is good because no one wants to learn from someone they don't like or get along with. And believe right. me, Hashem will open up doors for your daughter. But you have to be patient. That's all. And it will happen. Just maintain a wonderful relationship with her despite this difficulty and stop beating yourself up or you're going to be so... Uh, pregnant with guilt that it's going to stymie your ability to act wisely. Okay. Mm. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Thanks for your call. Absolutely. Very good. Wow. Yeah, I know the I know the feeling. I mean, there was so many so many people in my life that actually had led into you know the Christian faith, and now I'm looking back with. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't know if I were. I can't say I totally agree. I do, but I don't. It's like, to me, it's, for me, it looks like everything is a stepping stone. Even when I went to the Messianic movement, it seemed like, um, you know, that was wrong too. In fact, I, I, I'm more appalled by, um, by the Messianic movement than I am the Christian movement. But even still, it was a stepping stone for me to get from one, one place to the next. So I'm not really sure how to, how to feel about the past. Um, other well, than, you know, you know, if you look at the Bible, you know, in order for the Jews to leave Egypt, they did have to go through a wilderness, sure, right? Yeah. You know, and as it turns out, there are tens of, th there are hundreds of thousands of people. And that's only because I'm not sure of the numbers. It could be more. Right. But look, there are certainly hundreds of thousands of people who needed Jews for Jesus to come to the God of Israel that needed that transition. I mean, there's, it can be said that if we just take all the Christian missions to the Jews in the world and just generically call them Jews for Jews or the Messiah, whatever you want to, because they, they have variant belief, but let's just say they're all part of yeah, the If we could see all Jewish evangelism as one unit, that, that movement is more responsible for the conversion of Christians to Judaism, either as becoming B'nai Noach or becoming a Ger Tzedek, a full convert, than any other movement in recent times. And, and in, in, 
in, in, in millennia, mm -hmm. Haman was able to accomplish for the Jews what Isaiah couldn't. It's strange. Right. But Isaiah was successful in some areas of his life, particularly with uh, the Jews in Yerushalayim under Chizkiyahu, but he wasn't able to prevent the destruction of the rest of Judah. Lachish fell along with more than 40 cities. Um, Hosea wasn't able to prevent the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. But Haman was successful in, 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 in triggering a repentance among the Jewish people to say that they were kimu v'kibu, they accepted upon themselves the Torah because of that wasn't Haman's intention. It wasn't Jews for Jesus' intention to trigger the biggest tshuva in the world known since biblical times. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a way. Our enemy plotted, plots and plans against us. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Almighty, blessed be his name, he uses the plans of the enemies of Klal Yisrael to bring about blessings. So that's what's happening. Today. Great. Awesome. Awesome. All right, we'll take this next caller. Caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Yeah, this is Doug Granigan. Uh, Bill, I, I have another question I've always wondered about. I hope you don't mind me calling back. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, Rabbi, I've always wondered about this. This is kind of a risky question, kind of one of those questions that I feel is kind of like shouldn't be asked. <laughs> but I've always wondered why Why does God want to be worshipped? Interesting. Right. That's a very good question okay. because... That's a, thank you for that question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question. Thank you for joining us. So the reason why people ask the question is why does God want to be worshipped is because there's a part of us that has created God in our image. It's the, the Christian part of us. It's that neck down part of us that people like it when others say nice things about us, except me, me, I've never had such a thing. But there are, I heard in the news that there are such, there's such a concept that there are people who like it when they, when others say nice, flattering things about them. And, and therefore we then, because that's what Christianity is. Christianity is without a question, man's best effort to create God in his image. Judaism, conversely, is the reverse. It's God's successful effort to create man in his image. So if if that part of us, if the behema in us, the animal instinct of us, is to sort of see God in our own image rather than see us as a reflection of God, we go, well, I get it why I would like to people will say nice things about me because then I feel good about me and, and then I don't feel so bad about myself and and sometimes I could be self-critical. I know you, the viewer, have never been self-critical. I know you, the viewer, when you look in the mirror, all you do is compliment yourself and only see good and see no flow whatsoever. As it turns out, this is complete nonsense. Who is your biggest critic? Look in the mirror. So therefore, what happens is that if people are walking around with this trauma of feeling inadequate, of feeling a uh, self-loathing, of feeling that I'm really ugly, although I do things to try to make people feel attractive, so then compliments, in some sense, go quite a distance to ameliorate that pain and that we can think, oh, I am a good person. Oh, look how what nice things people say about me. So maybe this is what's going on, really. So when we have this this flow of compliments, it begins to somehow superficially take away the negative feelings. However, deep down, we're still struggling with that. And that's why you can have one, 100 compliments. 100 people will say you look good or you sound good or you're this. And one person who criticizes you, that one criticism is more painful, a thousand times more painful than the pleasure of a thousand compliments. Why? Why don't you just go, well, a thousand to one? A thousand compliments, right? 
oh, you look beautiful, you're wonderful, you're smart, you're sweet, you're this, and one person says something very bad to you, and you don't even need me to convince you that that one criticism just will shake your world up. Why? In what universe does this work? I mean, in any of what, whatever risks we take, getting on anything we do, we know that if if we would we would love a thousand to one ratios, either business investments, anything we do, we would we would gladly embrace that those kinds of numbers where six, the success rate is a thousand to one. Yet a one humiliation, one massive criticism is much worse on the scale, the negative scale, than a, a thousand compliments are. So here's what's happening. What's happening is that people really have a struggle with themselves and don't feel very good about themselves on a primal level. Why? I'm not going to get Freudian with you. But people do. They really struggle with this here. So people do what they can. They don't want to feel ridiculed. That's horrible. And people hope that others would think nicely about them. But what happens is when someone criticizes, when someone compliments, so in a sense, ah, they compliment because they don't really know the real me. But the person who criticizes, that person really knows who I, that's the real me. And therefore, it's absolutely catastrophic. That's why I'm talking to you, the listener. You could probably remember, even though you may not think you have the best memory in the world, every public criticism and humiliation, you probably can remember from 30 years ago, 40 years ago, like it was just yesterday. Perfect memory because it's so. So, what does this have to do with the question? Because we then impose it onto God. So, we think that Kosh Baruch Hu is like a person and he needs um, to feel good. He must like compliments the way we do. And this, of course, is complete with the soul. As it turns out, we are made of two things. We are made of of a, 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 a nefesh, a, a body, a nefesh of a hema, a physical human, a physical body. And our desires of a physical body is not distinct really from any of the other animals that we share this planet with. We understand what makes dogs do what they do. But then we have a neshama. Every human being has a neshama, has a soul. That's a chelk mimal mamish, means it's literally a spark of the divine. And this creates a lot of tension. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants what? That our physical body should sublimate to the spiritual, to raise the physical into the spiritual. Hashem wants people to connect to the to the highest point, and the best way to do that is to acknowledge Hashem. And the word barach or beirach or brach, any of that, that root, although it's frequently translated as blessed, like blesses God, blesses the king of earth, what, are we, what does he need those blessing for? He's like, he's so insecure, thank you, oh. Thank you, bless you, thank you. So that really it means to acknowledge. Really when we are mispalel, when we pray, we're really just lifting the physical into the spiritual realm. That's all that's going on. All we're doing is raising it up, raising the physical world, our physical world, into the spiritual realm. In fact, the word... L'hispalel, which means to pray, doesn't really mean to pray at all. L'hispalel really means, pilel, the, its root, means to think. L'hispalel is reflexive. It means to cause yourself to think. That's all it means. And why are we praying from words that were written by prophets? Why can't we just pray spontaneously alone without any aid of the prophets? Because as it turns out, the words of the book of Psalms are such that they just penetrate the neshama. Those words are were written Baruch HaKadosh with divine inspiration. And they're designed to go right to the neshama and lift you up. If you're not sure what I said is true, 
try this. You could test it out. The next time you're you're, you're set to engage in Aver, you're about to sin. So before you sin, try try you test this completely. You see if it works. So before you're about to sin, take out a Torah. It doesn't make a difference where. Just start reading the Torah. And you'll see what will happen. The, your desire to sin will run out the door. Run, jump out. It will, it'll just jump away from you. Because that's the power of these words. So, in reality, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is doing is, he is giving us the tools with which to raise up the physical into the spiritual realm. Physical is good, but make sure it is completely engulfed in the spiritual realm. Have Take those physical as don't do 1 Corinthians 7 with that shaita, a lumen, luminary of the church encouraged. Don't do that. Just make sure she's your wife and nobody else's wife. You want to eat, eat, but don't have to eat of, of an animal that's not clean, that's been torn to pieces. Don't do that. It means, but eat, but just make a brach on it. And that's what we're doing. So we are, we think of God as the old man in the sky with a long beard, and he's probably like the ultimate grandfather. This is a, a tremendous mistake, and everything in Tanakh is, is everything in Tanakh is there to remove, remove us from this state of, of defeating this desire to create God in our image. And this is why Christianity is such a successful religion, because instead of um, instead of healing the problem, it, 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 it's like someone who's on, on crack. And then, so you know how to get on? Why don't you try heroin? I mean, what Christianity is doing is offering something much, much worse. It's, more, it's offering idolatry in exchange for what are the other issues that are going on. Some other people who become Christians don't stop drinking alcohol. They do. They, they definitely put down marijuana. The problem is now they're doing spiritual heroin. So that, that's the problem is it's replacing one sin with something much, much worse. So in reality, HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't need anything. He is omnipotent and omniscient. He's all powerful and all knowing. And all the things that he's giving us, all the the Torah that he gave us and all the mitzvahs he gave us is only to raise us up from the physical into the spiritual realm in a world where you can go in either direction. And how do I find my way to the right direction? Only through the Torah. Anything else, run away from it. Thank you for your question. Okay, very good. Very good, very good. Moving on. All right, caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us where you're calling from. Hi, this is Clea Natanya. And I'm from Texas, actually, Welcome. and I wanted to ask um, a question about something that I heard that happened in September by a group called the Conference of the Organization of the Seventy Nations, where evidently there was a universal prayer and non-Jewish sacrifice on the Mount of Olives to cancel out the War of Gog and Magog, and I'm... I'm so confused by that. I mean, when I heard it, I, I thought, what is this nonsense? And I just wanted to know your take on it, Rebbe. So I, I confess that I am straight away completely unfamiliar with this. And, I, I, and without having any knowledge or familiarity with it, I can't possibly answer you in a way that's meaningful because I'm just not something that I'm familiar with. I, I do know that there are people who are actively tr trying to bring an education awareness of, of that we're living in a special time and want to bring the restoration of, of the worship of Hashem in the way it was in the former days, but I'm completely not familiar with these efforts, so I, I'm just not qualified to answer that question. Okay, but thank you for calling in. Okay, yeah, thank you for your call. Okay. Okay, well, uh, for you folks who don't know about it, uh, go to outreachjudaism.org. I'll put this on the screen, and so you can get the two-volume book set 
of Let's Get Biblical. And it's um, also the, the CDs that you see on screen are no longer available. However, let me answer this call. Uh, however, the audio files are. You just go to the website, albertstudiesm.org, and click on the tab that says Free Audio. And so, uh, yeah, and that's it. Okay, cool. We've got time for one more question. So, caller, please uh, tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hey, yes, hello. This is Kevin from New Jersey. Hello, Kevin. Welcome. And my question for the rabbi is um, basically uh, this. I'm familiar with the story in the Talmud about the uh, Messiah sitting at the gates of Rome. And I'm just uh, wondering what this is about. Hmm, great question. Okay. Thank you. Okay, very good. I don't know who you are, but I'm really just <laughs> just please take this as a as a deep gratitude to you for for asking a question like that. Thank you. Awesome. So go ahead and okay. hang up now and you can tune in for the answer. Alrighty. Thanks. All right, phone lines close this final final uh, topic for tonight. Thanks. Wow. It's like we had just a few very exquisite questions today. Uh, the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Daf Tzadik, Tzadik Zion, uh, in Talmud and Tractate, Sanhedrin 97, uh, conveys an episode where a Tana, his name was Yehoshua, his Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, he, I'm, I'm going to just stick with the, what is germane to the question, stay with it. He encounters Eliyahu Anovi at a cave of the cave that was where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had spent time. And he was, he wanted to know about, uh, uh, does he have a place in the world to come? I'm, I'm truncating this considerably. Uh, when is the Messiah coming? Questions of this sort. And he was told to go ask the Messiah himself. So naturally, he would ask the question, well, where, well, where would I find him and how would I identify him? So he is told that he's sitting at the gates of Rome, but he is not by himself. He's there with many other Jews. And what they all have in common is that they're all people who are suffering and wounded and sabrachin, you know, and sitting at the gates of Rome is not complicated because after all, Rome is the fourth and final exile. And this event occurred in the heat of the Roman Empire, really a very, very bad time. And Rome is Edom. It's the last, there are whole books in Tanakh devoted to the destruction of Edom, but how much damage it would wreak, wreak on Klal Yisrael to the point that when Daniel, when he saw the image of Rome, this he was horrified by it. It was something very horrible. So that the Mashiach, and other holy Jews, other saintly Jews would be there, meaning would be at the gates of Rome, meaning they're at ground zero of the of of Gullahs, and the end of all the filthy kingdoms would come with the coming of the Mashiach. So you have all these Jews who are there who are suffering, they all have bandages. This represents the, the pains and woundedness of our Gullus. But this presents a considerable problem because if we just have all these Jews at the gates of Rome, and these are, uh, some manuscripts don't have Rome in it, but our better manuscripts do. So we're just going with Rome. So, so this raises a particular problem, and that is, well, if I come to Rome and I discover there all these Jews who are just agonizing in pain and they're bruised and beaten and with all kinds of, everybody is just, is just a mess. How would I pick out which one is the Mashiach? So he's told that information is conveyed to Rabbi Shubin Levi. He says, this is how you're going to know which one, because these are all 
wounded individuals who never have all kinds of, of wounds on them. But there's a difference, why? Well, people have all these injuries, physical injuries, so you can't just let a, a wound fester. You have to put ointment on it. You have to put bandages on it to make sure that the wound doesn't become infected. The ointments are there to protect the wound so that it, it encourages and nourish healing and so on. However, as it turns out, watch the way these people change the dressing of these wounds. What do you mean? So imagine if somebody is really is just wounded all over his body. You have hundreds of people that are there in bandages. All of them have wounds. Right? So there could be two ways that these people could all be changing their bandages. One way is to first we'll take off all the old dressing off of every part of their body. And then once their body is completely clear of all the old bandages with all the old dressing, and this is the logical way to do it, you would then start with a fresh dressing, a fresh ointment, a healing ointment, and then you would put bandages, brand new fresh dressing around all those bandages. That will be one way. And I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure that's what they would do in a, let's say, a burn unit where they have to do that. They don't just, they change the whole thing. But give a look because there's going to be one person who doesn't, whose bandages are changed in a different manner. Now, this certainly can be in case you're going, okay, I follow the story, but it sounds a little odd. So this is a medrash, and it means that it could be literal, and it's fine to take this literal, or literally, or it's fine to take this as a metaphor. Either way is fine. It doesn't make a difference. When Talmud is not a history book, it's here to get the point. So the Mashiach, in contrast, he doesn't change his bandages that way. And you'll notice right away. So let's say a person has bandages on his stomach, on his thighs, on his head, on his feet, on his head, everywhere is bandages. So what he does is, let's say he has a bandage around his head. The first thing is he takes off the, bandage, the old bandage around his head and he takes off the dressing, puts on fresh dressing and puts on a new bandage. And then he goes to the right hand. Okay? And he changes that alone. He puts on a new one. Then he goes to his chest and he takes off the bandages from his chest and puts on a new one, one at a time. That's the person who's the Mashiach. Why? Why does he change his dressings in such a fashion? And the reason is that if you change your your bandages, the dressing and bandages all at once, it means you move all the bandages. So, if you if there's an emergency, it's going to take a lot of work to get you dressed up, ready to go, because you have no bandages on you. Mashiach could never be in that position. Why? Because he has to be in the position where he's ready to go, locked and loaded, ready to be launched. And as it turns out, Mashiach can come, could be called to bring about the redemption at any moment. All that has to be fulfilled is the prophecy of Isaiah 59, verse 19 and 20. You look it up for yourself. It's very beautiful. So therefore, he has to be ready. He can't take off all his clothes and put it on because what happens? He only put his socks on. He's not ready to go. Now, what happens is that, that Yeshua ben Levi comes to Mashiach and asks him, he, from the manner in which the Mashiach responded to Rabbi Shuv and Levi's question, he will discover that he was assured a place in the world to come. Um, and, and, and moreover, he's told that today is going to be the day of the redemption. And Rabbi Shuv and Levi makes his way back and is just shattered by that because as it turned out the day passed and Messiah hadn't come. And in his mind, the Messiah liked him because it didn't happen. So he's then informed today, if in fact, 
you will deserve it today if you will trigger it. Because the reason why it is forbidden to make calculations of when Mashiach will come is the is not so much that if it doesn't happen, it'll create disappointment, which is. But the big thing is that the major point is Mashiach can come at any time, but the the tshuva, the repentance of the Kal Yisrael, of Jacob, has to happen. And therefore, if it would happen, it would have happened today, but it didn't happen today. It's really quite beautiful. And what that should convey to Christians, because this comes up quite a bit, is that when you see the Mashiach suffering, and we're going to see it further going on in in Tractate Sanhedrin, and this is a very important chapter, it's cha- it's, it's Chelek, which Forget it, the whole chapter is devoted to this sort of agadato at Mashiach. It's rich, rich, rich. And that is that the Mashiach is no different than any other Jew. We're all suffering through our goals. The nafkamino, the difference in Mashiach and the other saintly Jews, the saint, the people who are followers of Hashem, is not that the Mashiach is less affected by Golos, is less wounded by Golos, or more wounded. The nafka, the difference is Mashiach has to be ready, where there's, if, if he had to come, there would only be, only at any given time, only one bandage that would have to be changed. And then he's ready to step forward at any time. And that's what's conveyed in this ecstatic um, event described in the Agadita and Mesechta Sanhedrin. Thank you so much for your question. All right, Rabbi, I guess that's a wrap for today. Um, I appreciate your time for sure. And thank you so much for all the viewers out there. Uh, Feel free to uh, reach out to us if you have any questions that you would like. Uh, Definitely call in and uh, leave a voicemail. Uh, Just state your name. Yeah, if if you happen to call the 855 number whenever the show's not live, all you need to do is to just state your name and your question is in as simple form as possible. And we might be able to get it on air even though it's, it's not live at the moment so um, and one other if I may yeah absolutely and one other thing is that if you have a question go to YouTube put my name in it and the question that's likely to come up on YouTube mm-hmm. absolutely absolutely all right Rabbi well thank you guys and we'll see you again next week Hashem willing y'all have a great week Shavuto bye everybody <laughs> Shumi So